how to evaluate COVID vaccines for a two-year-old and a five-year-old. I'm usually pro-vaccine, but apprehensive given the novelty of the mRNA mechanism. For what it's worth, kids are homeschooled. I would say no. I mean, yeah. and in fact, I think even even the authorities who are pushing this for absolutely everyone are saying under. I've, I've seen actually a couple of age ranges, but I've never seen anyone advocating for under six year olds. Yeah, I would, and first you know, of all, and, and homeschooled, they're at low risk anyway. But like, absolutely not for tiny kids. They also will not have tested these vaccines on kids. So, right. as far as I'm concerned, kids should be exempt for multiple reasons. Yeah, um, they're <clears> not not only aren't they getting COVID, but they're actually apparently not even transmitting it. So it's not even that they're vectors and they themselves don't get sick. Um, but, you know, yes, there have been a few cases, but yeah. not only are the schools mostly COVID free, um, but when there are outbreaks, it's going between adults and very rarely are the children even involved as vectors. So um, like, just keep it away from the kids. Yeah, keep it away from really. the kids. And really, yeah. I, I think we should set a fairly high age. I've and, seen 16. Yeah, but... I'm not even talking about 16. I, I'm talking about <laughs> how you, how do you hedge against the kinds of unknowns that come with a vaccine like this? Yeah. One way would be <clears throat> to decide that the people who are in least danger of getting it and suffering severe consequences be the ones who are exempted so that um, mm -hmm. we don't create a catastrophe. So yeah. I would be I would be inclined to exempt people below I don't know 30. Well, the argument then goes um, yeah. I mean, this this is complicated. Um, maybe the group uh, that should be getting mass vaccinated first are the so-called party animals. You know, the people who are at the center of of social groups. When people, you know, people like Nicholas Christakis do their you know social uh, network types of analyses, that yeah. the people who have many, many, many more connections than anyone else are the ones who are most likely to be spreading it. If they have whatever that additional like magic ingredient is that makes them super spreaders, which may have nothing to do with their social behavior, and it may have everything to do, um, I think if it did have everything to do with the social behavior, we would know that already. Though, yeah, is there? I, I don't know. Is there any indication that super spreaderness is about <clears throat> some individual characteristic rather than uh, an environment that's super conducive? Well, this is this is. I think you just sort of asked exactly the question that I was trying to get at as well. That. Um, I think that if it was just behavioral, uh, that that would be clear by now. And given that one of the few people who's really on this is Nicholas Christakis, and he is rock solid in terms of his analytical skills, and this is exactly squarely in his wheelhouse, because he's both a sociologist who studies social networks and also an MD, and actually just came out with this book that I haven't seen yet and this year about COVID-19. Um, that we would have some sense of super spreaders really being a behavioral thing. Uh, and because I haven't seen that, I think that there's going to be something else sort of epidemiological ideological uh, about individuals um, that is making them super spreaders. Um, but I, but I don't know. And I don't, I don't think we know, but I no. know that I don't know. My suspicion, and it may be that there's something on top of it mm -hmm. is that, you know, you're going to get people who are particularly productive in terms of, aerosolized particles yeah, um, because of the moment that they are in contact. So in other words, if you imagine an event, there'll be mm. some fraction of the population that is at maximum productivity of aerosolized uh, virus. Just because of the place and the trajectory of the disease relative to their own body when they go to the thing, right. when they go to so the restaurant imagine, or the party or whatever. You know, you got asymptomatic, sure. symptoms jump, productivity, and then it's going to drop off. So the prediction there is that everyone is a super spreader for like 12 hours in their disease progression, but most people don't hit. Um, no, I would oh, say, okay. I would say, let's take three items that would combine to create a super spreader event. Okay. You've got super so spreader event or individual? Same thing. Okay. You've got uh, somebody in their maximum productivity of aerosolized particle phase. You've got um, an event that creates the conditions like a low volume room without proper circulation and an activity that causes maximum production. So okay, but, uh, sure, but you just black box the thing we were talking about. I don't think so. The, the first thing in that list is you know, they're, they're at their most productive. So yep. this, this fits with what I just said, which is that you think that everyone has the capacity to be a super spreader if they happen, if it happens to be at that point in the trajectory right. of the disease. I, I, that is certainly a hypothesis. 
I would not put money on that hypothesis. Well, but I think it is more likely that there is something either either behaviorally about some people that makes them um, that and and there's a there's a long period during which they could be super spreaders. Or more like it, there is something else that we do not know about their particular genome, phenotype, development, something that interfaces with COVID-19 particularly Maybe. that makes those individual super spreaders regardless of what else is true. Well, it could even be that it isn't genomic and that it has to do with the accident of what tissues are. Uh, ah, good. You know, fourth have fourth the, hypothesis. You know, yeah. It's, if it's tissues that are expect, especially likely to produce aerosolized particles, for example. But mm -hmm. I guess my point is super spreader event is right. going to be a combination of things, and two of them might have nothing to do with idiosyncrasies. Absolutely. But that's why I asked you when you started this, I said, are you talking about the super spreader individual or the event? They're not the same thing. Well, they are because in each case- They're not. They're inherently the same because in each case, we have a super spreader, uh, the fact of a super spreader- event, which involves at least one individual who's spreading virus in some circumstances. So a super spreader is, event includes a super spreader individual, but they're not the same thing. There's, it's a nested set. No, my point is there's no way to have an individual and no event, right? The individual is intersecting other people. Ah, well, no, I, th I think that, that um, these hypotheses differ in that some of them assume that you could be an individual with the capacity to be a super spreader who doesn't find the right event. And that what you are what you are suggesting is that everyone, no matter what, if they end up COVID positive, has some period of time when, if all of the other parameters are right, will become a super spreader individual, but that, that, is, that, that there is nothing unique about them as an individual that makes well, them a super spreader. I think we know that's not true because there are, you know, there's a vast range of productivity. In other words, there are mild cases. What do you mean productivity of what? Aerosolized particles. Mm -hmm. There are lots of cases in which somebody is expected to produce very few of these things over the entire course of their disease. But some had... of the super spreaders have apparently been asymptomatic. So it's not just about, um, you know, the current model of its aerosolized particles and that's how you, that's how you spread it. So, I mean, the, well, it, it's, it's way more chaotic in terms of, it's just, it's just not clean. Well, I, I'm not saying it is. Uh, I'm a little bit doubtful about an asymptomatic person being a super spreader. Maybe you've seen something I haven't seen. I've I've seen some stuff, and I also have one very strong anecdote of um, just an entire an entire workforce at an office with something between ten and fifteen people uh, go, getting positive after one person who had just breathed in a room for a couple of hours without a mask and never showed any symptoms, and then they all went in there masked. Um, for a, for a meeting for an hour, mm. and every single one of them came out positive. Within, Where is this? I can't say it on air. Okay. No. Oh, it's a uh, it's not a published thing. No, this th that so I I've seen some stuff and I have to dig it up. But this this anecdote is a situation that I know of personally. Oh, okay. Um, and it you know the the person one of the people involved and I were talking about it and, um, you know they were they were shocked. Like no one expected that someone who was asymptomatic could have gotten so many people sick. And, and they never came down with symptoms? They never came down with symptoms. And almost none of the people who then tested positive came down with symptoms either. And none of them got really sick. But um, all, of, all of them did. And then none of the people that that office worked with you know, and they shut down completely for two weeks and all of this. And, you know, they didn't, they did not get any of the, their people who they work with as in terms of the business that they do sick. Um, because they were very, very careful to immediately quarantine.